Statistics. Uh, my name is Dan Haynes. Um, I'm the director here at Vincent's uh, and I take care of all the computer forensic matters that we work on. A um, little bit about me. Um, so I'm a chartered accountant. My background is as a chartered accountant, having moved into investigations um, with Vincent's and then as part of all those investigations that we do, dealing with a lot of electronic evidence and electronic um, type investigations moving into computer forensics. So that's my basic background um, as an investigator. And here at Vincent's, we take care of a lot of theft of, theft of intellectual property matters, um, some um, calculations of loss as they relate to loss of data and preparing expert reports in the vein of computer forensics. So that's that's my role here at Vincent. So uh, it's great to be able to speak to you all today. Um, this is a general webinar. My intention here is to be able to talk to clients or to people who might be um, intending to use a computer forensic expert. Um, and it's intended for general use. If you have any questions, any specific questions, please contact me after the webinar, or I think you might be able to some post some questions as we go. So that's that's fine as well. Otherwise, I'll um, I'll move through the presentation today. What I'd like to talk about, um, so that we're all aware of what terms I'm referring to. Uh, I always try and avoid jargon or or techno speak wherever possible. So sometimes there are some specific terms. So if I'd like to talk about some concepts first with regards to computer forensics, then the application of what we do. So in order to get a good outcome from this type of work, it's really important to manage um, communications and expectations with our clients. So no, nothing of what we do in this field is magic. Although there are some operators out there who would like to think that anything that was ever typed into a computer or anything that was ever viewed on a computer is always recoverable and presentable. That's certainly not always the case, that there are some limitations to what we do. And my intention is to always be as transparent as possible. So um, in talking about data, we'll talk about is it recoverable? Is it possible to check my phone? Um, I get a lot of calls from clients um, quite desperate that they've been hacked. And that can be a very intrusive and and stressful process. So I like to talk through a few of those issues that might help uh, if you think that's happened to you. Um, and then talking about how to prevent perhaps being a victim of hacking or perhaps preventing losing your data. So all of these points are tied up in, in the computer forensics side. And, and always important to remember that prevention, the old adage prevention is much better than the cure, much, much better and, and easier as well. It's much easier to prevent a lot of these things from occurring than it is to try and remedy what occurs afterwards. So um, where to start is that most of my clients um, aren't aware of a risk or aren't aware of just how much they rely on electronic intellectual property until something actually happens. So what that means is that um, the value of your intellectual property is probably far higher than most businesses realize. And it's perhaps a little bit more vulnerable than most people would care to admit. And I know during these COVID times, these pandemic times that some businesses might have a little bit lost control of their data, the feeling that the genie's out of the bottle a little bit. Um, and although that is a pretty common feeling these days, there are things that you can do to, to prevent that. We perhaps won't cover all of those strategies in today's talk, but it's something to remember that it's never too late to start putting in some controls. And sometimes the simplest controls are the easiest ones to implement and the cheapest ones and the most effective. So that's something I'd like to, to also talk about as we go. So often businesses and employers aren't aware of how vulnerable they are until an instance of electronic theft actually occurs. And we see this all the time. And of course, I, I don't see, um, I tend not to see businesses that have very strong controls because they're not the ones subject to um, an incident or, or a cybercrime type of incident. Um, but there are steps you can take anytime now uh, that might help protect you. So uh, we'll get started. My role, um, again, is not at all any sort of computer whisperer or any sort of um, 
secretive type processes. It's it really is something that's been around for for a time, generally with regards to expert evidence, but also more specifically with regards to use of data. So um, identifying what type of electronic evidence might be relevant in a case, uh, preserving that so that sometimes litigation can be months, many months or many, perhaps a few years away, performing the analysis so that it's it's repeatable and reportable and then presenting that evidence in court. So that's that's my basic role. Now, there, there are people who deal purely in preservation of data uh, or identification of relevant data, and that might be a normal IT provider. But the analysis and the presentation is something that we like to think is in that expert domain that we can work with our clients to get a good outcome for them from their um, computer forensic type or cyber uh, forensic type incident. So that's my basic role, having started as a chartered accountant and now moving into or being involved in computer forensics for a, for a number of years now. So um, now uh, identification of evidence, as I think as we're not, I think as we are all aware now, it's not always just a computer. It's uh, days gone by when we used to always uh, move to a site and then seal up all the computers, take them away with us, do the analysis. That's not the case anymore. And sometimes it's it's not a computer at all. Of course, it might be um, devices that are attached to a network, so photocopiers, scanners. It might be storage devices, so USBs, personal data. Uh, very much so now, it's the cloud. So the internet, the, the internet of things and, and cloud, Google drives and things like that. Um, and then of course, uh, consumer electronics. So your phones is, is a very big area of evidence in terms of um, computer forensic matters. And they are all um, relevant to, and we can acquire and analyze and preserve and present those um, as we need to. So keep in mind, it's not always the computer. Another term that we hear a lot about and a term that used to be a little bit mysterious, um, but I think a lot of um, people are quite au okay with now is the term metadata, having been involved in, in some of the legislation that's come in recently with regards to cybercrime. Uh, so metadata is simply data about data. And we used to think of it, or we used to explain it as being perhaps if you were sending a physical letter to someone, that the letter inside might be the data, your message to to whoever you were sending your letter to, but there are things you could learn about that letter that weren't part of the actual physical, or I should say the primary data itself. So the stamp um, might be dated. Um, it might have a sent date or a sent address. Uh, it will have often a stamp of the post office that whereas it was uh, transferred through on the way to its final destination. So all of those things tell us information about the letter. Um, and so we call that that's referred to as metadata. So data about data. Um, we can think of it electronically as if you send an email, for example, the similar things, the example to a physical letter, is basically the same. You have on the face of it, the message that's in the email, but we can also acquire things like what service it was passed through on the way to its destination, where it was sent from, the dates, were there any attachments, all that type of information. And that can all be acquired and preserved. Now, those things are often referred to also as file properties. And they're often important because in computer forensics, we can sort by or analyze according to those file properties. So if we're only looking for emails that were created by a certain person or perhaps deleted by a certain user or perhaps modified at a very specific date and time, we can extract documents, emails, SMS messages that correspond to that type of criteria. So we can extract that and it might refine a huge amount of information down to just a couple of, of relevant items. And that's another part of the computer forensic process is we don't wanna look at every single document, every single item, we can refine it, sort it and search for things that are relevant. And it's a really big part of what we do. And that's why we wanna preserve that metadata as we find it. We don't wanna leave any fingerprints at the scene um, and we wanna make sure that it's all um, easily searchable. So that's, that's metadata. So the reason we do that, we're acquiring as much evidence as we can so that 
we can often, if we've acquired a device, for example, that will preserve things like deleted files and we can perhaps recover those and they might be important to a litigation or to someone who has lost their homework or whatever the case may be and important information can often be recovered if the process is followed at, a, at an industry best practice level. We can preserve things like the date that people logged in, perhaps passwords that were entered incorrectly, uh, what activity has taken place on a computer. We can then repeat these findings in court and that's all very important. So gone are the days where an expert had to uh, reel an old, or wheel an old computer into court. Hopefully when they turn it on, everything works and they ask the court to review something that's on the screen of that computer. So we don't have to do that anymore. They're all very, <clears throat> we can preserve it. We can provide a document to the court um, and demonstrate any findings that are relevant to the court making a decision on a, on a factual basis. And that's basically computer forensics. It's not magic. Um, the data has to exist for us to generally to form an opinion. If it doesn't, then the opinion might be in a different vein. We might acquire things from elsewhere, but the basic process is, is generally exactly that. We need to identify what evidence we have, preserve it so that we can uh, analyze it and then present that evidence in court. So that's our basic process. So moving on, we can search that data very efficiently. If we have an attribute that's important, perhaps an author or pictures at a certain location, or perhaps only deleted files might be what we're interested in. Uh, we can extract evidence according to that criteria because we preserved it exactly as it was when we found it. And it will always stay that way, read only evidence. So we catch deleted fragmented data. Sometimes it's passwords, sometimes it's activity. Different versions of documents can present themselves, which might be important. Um, changes have been made. And if there are any duplicates is also very important. So that can all be um, born out of evidence that we acquire electronically. So it's a, it's a very efficient process. Those are the benefits that we try to bring to our clients. Because what we're acquiring and what we're producing is a perfect copy of the original. Uh, information today involves perfect copies. Not like the bad old days of analog videotapes or, or photocopying information and, and it degrading every time that process happens. Uh, a perfect copy of a digital file is always going to be preserved and, and remain in state. So with that in mind, let's talk about um, is deleted data always recoverable? And I have to manage this kind of expectation with clients, and that is that they expect that being a computer forensic expert and, and that they've provided me with their computer that any file that was ever uh, stored on this machine or any activity that was ever undertaken, any website that was ever visited is going to be recoverable just straight away, easily. Now, sometimes that's the case, and they're generally the matters that I like to tell clients about in this type of presentation, but it really isn't always 100% the case. And we really don't know what we're going to find on a computer until we look. And sometimes the cost of looking and not finding is the same as looking and finding everything. So um, that's an expectation that we need to manage and something that clients need to be prepared for. So is deleted data recoverable? Well, yes and no. Um, so that's sometimes not an answer that everyone's comfortable with, but there are factors that affect whether or not we're going to be able to pull back that deleted email or that deleted file. So the best case scenario under those circumstances is a typical Windows-based PC, perhaps an older operating system even, um, that has an internal hard drive that we can analyze. And that hard drive or that computer is really used for some emails, surfing the web sometimes, writing some letters using Office. Um, that gives us a good chance of recovering, for example, a deleted file or a deleted document because that's pretty light use. Um, there's not much chance that files are being overwritten by newer data. And um, that's, that's really our best client. If we have the similar scenario with an Apple Macintosh, for example, um, and Macs are much more important, uh, big, much more uh, common now than they used to be. <clears throat> we used to see an Apple Macintosh perhaps on one every 
15 to 20 jobs that we're involved in now, I would expect to see an Apple Mac at almost every job that we do. They employ um, a different file system to a Windows PC. And the file system employed by Apple Macs uh, tends not to preserve or tends not to render deleted data recoverable. And that's simply a message I provide to clients. So when they call me up and say that they might like to recover some deleted information, might be one of the first things I ask will be, well, what sort of device is it? How heavily is it used? And how long ago was the file deleted? So because a, a hard drive will fill up and overwrite all the data that has been deleted, the sooner you have your device checked, the better. For, the, for that reason, that fragments of data or older files will be eventually overwritten or, or consumed by newer data. And so it's simply an expectation we have to let clients know about that. Look, if it is a photo that you had on an old PC uh, five years ago, we're probably not as good a chance of recovering that as if we were, of course, if it was deleted a month ago or last week. And that's the case with, with that's the, an overriding assumption that we have to adopt with clients. So the solution to all of these things, and you'll hear me harp on about this quite a bit, is that if you have a backup of your data, um, no matter which device it has, if it's your phone, if it's your computer, if it's a USB that you have, somehow um, store your backup securely, separately, and you can recover things from there. You won't need expensive computer forensic services. Um, you'll have that at your fingertips. So sit down, look at what data is valuable to you and what's important, whether it be personal or professional, and get a secure backup of that data. If the takeaway from today might be nothing more than that. Um, do it today because we often do get clients asking us to help them and they said, look, I was about to buy a new backup disk. I was, it was on my list of things to do, but I never got around to it. So it is important and it's easy. Do a backup of your data. All right. So similar things. Can you check my phone for deleted SMSs? Uh, or for a photograph that I deleted, or for some call logs, I need to verify that my former spouse agreed to certain um, agreements. Um, can you verify those from a text message that I deleted when I was angry? So yes, we can, but again, it does depend. And there are some conditions, so talk about those. So we'll need your phone for a period of time. Often it's only for a few hours, it might be in rare circumstances. If you have a very large phone, it might be more than a day or a day or more. We'll need your access code, we'll need your PIN um, to do that. Devices these days, phones I'm talking about, are much more secure than they were even a few years ago. A few years ago, we, we have certain forensic tools here at Vincent's that we use. Now, a few years ago, those forensic tools gave us access to almost any phone operating system hardware that you could come up with, including Apple phones. Um, and that became obvious to the providers. So to people like Apple and Samsung and, and Sony, uh, they realized that their devices were storing increasingly important and valuable information and their customer uh, database was getting larger and larger. And so to appease markets, to appease Wall Street, uh, they upped their security considerably. And, uh, you know, speaking from experience, I can say that Apple phones are very secure um, to most people. So we can't access a phone easily without your passcode. Now, there's two takeaways from that. Put a passcode on your phone. If you don't have one, put it on there immediately um, and you'll be way ahead of um, most people who are very vulnerable to this type of attack. So... When we do an analysis, we don't put any records back onto your device. The results of any searches or extractions or recovery that we do, we'll place them on a separate USB and give it to you within a report. Usually it's a, it's a PDF file with all your data in it. The reason being for that is if the more that we intervene with a, a telephone or a mobile phone operating system, the more likely it is to become corrupt. So we don't interfere with that at all. We acquire all the data, do our analysis external to the phone, and then provide you with the records that you need. So sometimes we have clients saying, I just want these messages or these photos put back on my phone. We don't do that. Um, we can provide them to you separately. Um, 
So security of mobile devices is improving all the time and the providers are always catching up to the most recent updates. So at the moment, we're a little bit behind forensically in terms of the latest Apple operating system or the latest Galaxy, but um, we're catching up all the time. Moving on. Now the solution to this, I've, I've mentioned always use a pin. Um, if your device is the latest updated and patched, then we're much less of a chance of being able to access your data without the pin compared to an older device that uses out of date software, which are quite vulnerable. So always use a pin, keep it up to date. Um, if you do want things recovered, we'll ask you for that pin. And hopefully you'll have a backup. It's very easy to backup um, these devices. They're normally connected to the internet anyway, so they'll back up through the cloud or, or to a local machine. I highly recommend that strategy of having a backup of your data, secure and separate. Next most common question we get, <clears throat> I've dropped my USB or at least my USB hard disk has all my photos on it. It's now not working. Can you help? Well, again, in terms of physical damage, uh, it depends. I'm so, sorry that that's the answer all the time, but most hard drives and especially modern hard drives, which, which have um, solid state disk technology, they're quite robust. Um, so we've recovered disks and we've recovered data from those disks that were fully submerged in the case of a flooded business. Um, but each case is different and we would assess and and triage your disk as we have to. But again, it's not always the case that we'll recover everything. The best thing to do and the best way to get a good outcome from this type of physical damage is to not keep turning your device on and off and checking if it's clicking and, and shaking it, maybe banging it. Please don't do that. Um, the best thing to do is if you've established that really your device is probably physically damaged, is to leave it, take it to a data recovery specialist. They can evaluate it in state and then check out the probability of, of recovery. So don't give it to your next door neighbor who says they're good at IT. If you really want a good outcome, it's not a great idea. Best thing to do is take it to, a, to an expert because much better chance of recovering that data if they can get to it sooner before more damage occurs. So every time you power on uh, a disk, it might be causing more damage. So really, we want to prevent that. And again, so a familiar solution here and the best defense, uh, get a backup of your data. So often a USB hard disk, I understand that they do store a lot of photos, a lot of um, a lot of files and things like that. But often it should be your USB that's just a backup and your primary storage should be somewhere else, probably on a computer itself, or you can attach a permanent hard drive to a computer and then just use your external USB as a backup only. Really, they shouldn't be your primary uh, storage device. So the next big question that clients ask me is have I been hacked? Well, maybe you have but maybe not. And look, in terms of personal hacking, uh, most commonly in cases where hacking is suspected, it's because your account or your personal data was either very vulnerable or you haven't actually been hacked in a criminal sense, but perhaps there is someone that is, is able to access your data because you've given them access to your data. And by that, I mean, the most common thing that we see is where a device, perhaps an older device or an iPad that you no longer require has been handed down to a family member or to um, someone that you know, or perhaps you've even sold your device without removing your personal information from that device first. And that gives someone access to um, your passwords. For example, you might have a file note. I've seen file notes on devices that are called passwords and it has a list of someone's password. And we have used those to access important information. or where, for example, a child has an old device with the email account still logged in. So we had an, we had a case where um, a family law matter where one party was going to um, meet with um, their lawyers, perhaps in a mediation type uh, environment, and the other side was able to, well, effectively knew what their strategies were going to be and knew um, what their position was in terms of a settlement. So that put them at a disadvantage it, or at least it wasn't a level playing field. The reason for that being 
um, an iPad was with a child. The child had was part of shared custody and the email account was in use on that iPad still. So correspondence between um, family members and between uh, even lawyers was accessible from that email account. So do be careful with your data. Um, I've also had cases where the same password was used for every account for banking, for web, uh, webmail accounts or an Outlook type account. Um, and that gave someone that knows you very well, either a sibling or a very good close friend or a business partner or a former spouse, if they know what your password is or they know you very well, they might be able to guess what that password will be for multiple accounts. So past that we call that recycling or reusing, make sure you have a, at least comp a complex password and that it's different for every account. I know that appears onerous, but that really prevents this type of vulnerability. So, so you need to use that. Um, and the most simple uh, security process that we can recommend is two-factor authentication. Now that's a sort of a complex sort of phrase for something that's actually very simple. Um, you should have two-factor authentication. Sometimes you'll see it printed as 2FA on all of your banking accounts, all of your uh, webmail accounts. Uh, and sometimes the setting up of two-factor authentication might appear a little bit complex or something that you've been putting off. But often, if you only do it once, once you've established your identity to your bank or to your software uh, email, you don't have to do it again, or at least not very often, maybe only um, once a month or, or even less. So I really highly recommend the second big takeaway from today. So make sure you have backups of your data. Use two-factor authentication. It would prevent a huge amount of, of cyber crime and, and loss of data and money um, everywhere, all around the world. So make sure you use it definitely with your banking. If nothing else, definitely with your banking. So um, the most common at this stage and, and real, real hacking, this really does happen, occurs in the form of, of crypto attacks or ransomware attacks. And these are particularly nasty because they are very intrusive and um, effectively in the case of a, a crypto or an encryption attack, impossible to remedy without um, having dealt with the hacker itself and, and perhaps paid for a password or having to restore all of your devices and ransomware that, where there's been a clear loss of data. So your personal data leaving your the confines of your network and, and being somewhere else and perhaps you're having to pay money to get it back. The way this happens generally is a user or an internet link, uh, sorry, a user will come across an internet link or something that's um, they wish to download. And often um, these files are hidden, of course, so it might appear as an important file that you need, um, Australia Post parcel delivery or a, a piece of software that you need to make your computer run better. Um, that's accessed or downloaded by someone and they're either fooled into entering their personal information, so their, their username or their password, um, and or simply opening the file itself means that you now are infected or you've lost control of your machine. So um, be extremely wary. These things are happening every day. It's extremely common. Perhaps now the most common attack will be a link in an email or a download from the internet exposing you to a virus. So responses to these are if you if you have an extreme case and you have access to a, an expert, um, consider um, getting them to assist you. Look, in extreme cases, people often do pay the ransom um, because encryption is effectively unbreakable and there's no other option, um, especially where you have no backups uh, or you have no other source of data to remedy your case. So it, it's, it, is, it is a terrifically intrusive and, and difficult way to lose your data. So the solution is that make sure you have a good antivirus uh, software, make sure it's up to date make sure that it works well with your device's operating system and that your computer is also fully patched. And all of these things, apart from the purchase of the antivirus software, so keeping your device up to date, very easy, automatic. So if you need to recover your data after a crypto attack, back to solution one, you have external backups that are stored separately to your main data and restoring them from there. But it is an extremely complex issue. And this is the this is the priming, primary case 
of prevention being far, far better than the cure. So I really, um, the takeaways being back up your data and use two-factor authentication. So they're the, they're the big things for today. Um, so just to go over those again, the takeaways for today being, we'll never be able to eliminate the risk of um, people outside of your organization wanting to get your data, especially when it has value. Perhaps you're not aware of what the value of that is. So the weakness in any network is the human. So it's always the biohazard. Um, there are networks out there that are extremely strong and perhaps um, the lowest risk that can possibly be attained for a computer network. But the weakness, it will always be the human that they'll click on a link or they'll download a file or enter their details to a website that looks like your bank or your Microsoft account, but it is not. Um, and so that's really where we're at. Uh, that's almost unpreventable, the human. So put pin codes on your mobiles, be alert, avoid suspicious email attachments or emails with links to websites that you don't know. You can always hover over attachments or to links and see where the actual link goes. Uh, they might be trying to induce you to go to Commonwealth Bank or to Microsoft, but in fact, it's to some bizarre um, website uh, somewhere else. Um, you can always hover over and try and discover the source of that. Don't open an email or at least definitely not a link that you're not 100% certain of the source. And keep operating systems and antivirus software patched and up to date. Use complex passwords. A lot of IT professionals now use a sentence as their password. So the sentence might be, I like walking through a rainy field on a hot summer's day, whatever the case might be. So a really long sentence is actually their password that they can remember. So, and they use a different sentence for every account that they have. Now that seems onerous, but um, you, it's too bad. <laughs> Effectively, you should have a method for doing this. Um, I use uh, a password application that stores all of my passwords securely and in an encrypted state so they can never be hacked. I just have to remember one password to access my application and then I actually log into all the websites through the application itself. I don't I don't use it as an inbuilt browser. I don't use uh, Chrome or, or Edge or anything like that. I use the application that I have that stores my passwords. It's called a password manager application. There's There's quite a few of these around now, it will generate and store passwords for you. And they're unique to each site. So I highly recommend a password manager. Take advantage of two factor authentication. It's uh, probably one of the most important things that we can do. So um, it's a code generated either by an app or um, a separate email to a separate source, usually to your phone, but it can send you an email to a separate uh, account. It will then provide you with a code that unless you have that verified device in your hand or that verified email account, then that's the only way to access the service, internet banking or email, whatever the case may be. Um, so that would prevent 95% of the hacking that I see at my practice here at Vincent's. So it's very simple. Um, and often the people that are hacked, simply the ones that didn't have two-factor authentication. Um, it's really important and it's so simple, works great. It's easy to use and I highly recommend it to everyone watching today. Um, so the final thoughts are, and before we finish off, thank you everyone for staying with us. Um, there's a reason that these issues sound repetitive and that is that these are the things that work. They're simple, they work. They're generally um, low cost, but highly effective. So keep your device up to date, have antivirus. Keep passwords secure. Don't reuse passwords for different devices and different accounts wherever you can. Use unique passwords. If in doubt, don't click on links or files that you don't trust. If it's too good to be true, of course, it is too good. It is not true. If it's too good to be true, it can't be true. Um, seek advice from a professional if you really do need data recovery. Be prepared for the worst. If you don't back up your data and store your backup securely, and if you don't have two-factor authentication, you're very vulnerable to attack. So. They're the messages for today. Uh, really appreciate everyone listening. Um, 
I'm Dan Haynes, all of Forensic Technology Matters here at Vincent's. I'll be pleased to talk to anyone about that. Um, if there's any, uh, any um, questions that I've missed, please feel free to send them through. My details are on the, on the Vincent's website. Um, I hope today was useful and uh, thanks for listening. Much appreciated. Thanks.